And we're back with some more oxygen not included and we're putting together a little list today. How long it is, I don't know. I haven't decided what I'm going to put in it all the way. It'll be in the description though so you'll know uh, yourselves. What we're going through today is all the nice big large contraptions you can build that can technically help out your colony. Well, when I say technically, some of these things get a little bit oversized and get to the points of impracticality where you're thinking, why bother? So to start us off, we are just going to start off with your basic petroleum boiler. This would be the smallest and probably the most practical design on the list. These things, of course, take crude oil, they boil it up, and after the crude oil is boiled, it turns into petroleum at a one-to-one -one ratio. And the reason you might want to go and build one of these is if you try and convert crude oil to petroleum using the building provided, you only get half the petroleum out. This doubles the amount of energy you can get out. Also almost doubles the amount of uh, polluted water you get out, meaning this is water sustainable. This would, of all the things on the list I'm going to put on, probably be the one you'd actually want to go and build. It will help out your colony more than anything else. But there are so many different ways of sticking one of these together. You just need a heat source to heat up your uh, crude oil, and down here we're just using a thermium or a space metal aqua tuner that provides the heat source and that converts the crude oil. But you don't have to go with something quite that, quite that organized. You know what? Organized is not quite the right word. Quite that uh, tame. If you don't want to use a heat source out of that, you can use magma as your heat source. And how you get the magma down there, there's many, many different ways. But sometimes what you can do is you can vacuum out a huge chunk of the map and flow magma from all over the place. You'll notice there's like volcanoes all spread across here. And those volcanoes are dropping magma all the way down here, which flows eventually in here. Uh, I don't know what this stockpile is doing, but you know what? Who cares? This is magnificent. Now, all that's happening is the, the magma gets down here, it transfers heat up into the gold tiles, that gets transferred through to the petroleum and the petro oh, transferred into the crude, I should say. If we grab a lump of crude there, yeah, the crude originally start, well, the crude needs to hit about 402 degrees. You need to go a couple of degrees beyond the, the change point, at which point it will turn into petroleum. So all you need is a decent heat source and you can arrange that. And this is one of the reasons why this is so handy. You can usually use volcanic heat or geothermal heat or heat you generate yourself using space metal to get one of these up and running and they will last you for a very, very, very long time. How long did this one last? Let's check. This one has been around for... Oh, age unknown. Never mind. It's out before a different patch. Anyway, that would be the first item on the list. Oh, for reference, this thing can produce about five petroleum boilers worth of power. Just to give us a bit of a, a scale of what we're working with here. So five petroleum boilers but worth of power is what most petroleum generators, petroleum boilers will get you. Just just one more boiler, actually. I, I realized the last two were way too, mm, too rigid, too well organized. There's, uh, you know, they're, they're all bad words. The last two were uh, too samey, too clinical. This one is a more, much more organic petroleum boiler. Oh, and a big thank you to Flavio for the previous petroleum boiler. Uh, I... I nicked their map from Base Loving 8, so yeah, thanks very much for that, Flavio. This one was sent in by Omni X Pro. I think I pulled this out of Base Loving 9. Uh, this is the exact same petroleum boiler design. It just, uh, you know, it takes a slightly different route when it comes to counterflow heat exchanging. As you can see here, the crude is flowing through and just popping down. Just to demonstrate that, yes, there's more than one way to do these things. And there's always different ways to do things when it comes to oxygen not included. And this is what we're going to call the... Five, yes, this is going to be our number five on our list. For number four on our list, you know what? We will just scoot across here. Uh, thanks again for the map, OmniX. Uh, where is it? There is, on this map, a sour gas boiler. So coming in at number four, we're going to go with sour gas boilers. Sour gas boilers are actually very similar to petroleum boilers. The only thing is, you just go hotter. Instead of stopping at making petroleum, you keep going until you hit 538 degrees and you get sour gas. That sour gas, unfortunately, is, is useless to you unless you take that sour gas, counterflow it all the way down and chill it down to a uh, very, very chilly. What is it? Methane? Yeah, somewhere around minus 162 or so degrees. Once you get down about there, this is going to minus 175 because of course it is. Once you get down to about that temperature, the sour gas turns into methane. And once you heat it up again, it turns into natural gas, which you can burn in your uh, natural gas generators. These things are incredibly complicated to stick together. You have to take something, heat it all the way up, and then to make this worthwhile, you sort of have to counterflow that heat back around. So if we'll check here, I think this is, does it in batches, so it might not be on at the moment. Yep, the crude oil is 80C. 
it flows all the way down here. By the time it gets to the bottom, it's going to be hitting close to 500 degrees. Well, a little bit over, actually. And then that sour gas counterflows the opposite direction, heating up the incoming crude oil just to help save the heat. And then it does the same thing counterflowing down here. It counterflows against the natural gas going up. So the natural gas starts off nice and chilly, and by the time it gets to the top, it's been heated up a bit because it's dumped a bunch of chill into that sour gas. These are incredibly complicated to stick together. They, they will mess with your head, but and they take up an enormous amount of space. But the amount of power gener generated is absolutely ludicrous, depending on the design you use. This design is a little bit more industrial scale. It can... Uh, it can process about 10 kilos of crude oil into natural gas. Now, you don't get out 10 kilos of natural gas. I think you lose about a third of it, and some of it turns into this completely useless sulfur. So you do lose some of the resources as it gets transformed. But, dear Lord, look at the amount of, uh, look at the amount of natural gas that's churning out of here. And to really put it in perspective, just how much power you're getting out of it. Oh, this map was sent in by Ixthus. Uh, base eleven seventeen. Yes, and it's this is the ancient this is the ancient Greek word for fish. Learn something new every time you Google. This is how many natural gas generators it takes to burn it off. <laughs> yes, that's a lot of natural gas generators. To put this in perspective, the petroleum boiler was producing about five petroleum generators worth of power. This this uh, little monstrosity is producing twenty nine petroleum boilers worth of power that's or sorry yeah, petroleum generators worth of power that's a big increase in fact the amount of power this generates is just so ludicrous most bases can't you can't build enough stuff to consume all the power though uh, you can see here the power wires support up to 50 kilowatts but who cares you're going to be generating more than that you'd actually have to split your electrical grid to make it work correctly but if you've got time and you want to build something a little bit large, this one is a batch boiler, so it doesn't actually run constantly. But uh, if you want to build something that generates you a ludicrous amount of power, go for it. This design will generate you all the power you could ever possibly want and then some more on top of that. There's a general argument made that it's, it's sort of pointless building one of these because normally between a petroleum boiler and solar you're usually covered or yeah, there's just so many ways to get power that this is sheer overkill. But realistically, no. No, this is just an awful lot of fun trying to figure it out and get it working. Anyway, that is number four on our list. Coming in at number three is a slightly controversial choice. Actually, hmm, I should really point out, this is my own personal list. So, you know, you, you're free to disagree with me and think other things are more ludicrous or bigger, or better, whatever. But this one here is a regolith melter. Now, this when it was first sent in by Roland Ireland, base loving number five... There was no other way to get tungsten at the time. Tungsten was a finite resource and you could only get so much of it on a map. However, it was discovered by people that if you got insulation, which you currently did exist on the map, and you heated insulation so hot that it melted, as in you got it heated it up to 3,621, well, two degrees above that point, above that just stupidly high number, if you heated it above that point, it would melt. And when it melted, it turned into tungsten. So insulation melted into tungsten. The problem was, how do you hit temperatures that hot? Pretty much everything just turns to gas long before it even gets to that point, and you need to go hotter than that to be able to melt it. Well, what you do is you go to the good old metal refinery. Metal refinery takes a liquid coolant to help it... Uh, well, okay, liquid coolant is a, a problem. If you put liquid into it, that liquid will get all the heat dumped into it. And the liquid you're putting in here is niobium. That's right. Space metal, one of the rarest metals in the entire game, has been liquefied, and it is passing through these pipes at 3,800 C. That is... that's pretty hot. Now, you have to spread it out across all the pipes. The reason it's spread out across these, so long as you keep it below 2 kilos per pipe, and you'll notice there's less than uh, 2 kilos of liquid going through each one of them, but so long as you're putting it through at less than 2 kilos per pipe, it won't break the pipes even if it cools down. So, what's happening right now is, all of that liquid niobium is passing through these pipes and it's slowly but surely heating up this uh, this pipe here. So if we check the temperature on this one, it's 2315, 2318, 2326. It's slowly but surely going up and up and up. And what is generating the heat for this? Well, steel. This thing runs on steel. Not exactly the easiest thing to keep running at all times, but that's how this thing runs. Not only that, there's a several other things you have to do to make this work. I mean, you can't let the niobium cool too much, because if the niobium cools too much, it will solidify in the pipes and break. 
so all of the niobium is filtered through this giant diamond block to regulate out the temperature, and then it gets dumped back in here so it can be sent around again. There's also a little bit of uh, heat going on, heating going on over here. This is uh, this is a radiant pipe full of liquid steel. Yes, that liquid steel is passing through there. And that's helping regulate the temperature of this giant temperature-controlled diamond brick. And that liquid, yeah, that liquid down there is liquid niobium. Try and conceive of the amount of time and effort it took to build this absolutely ludicrous device. Think of the amount of heat that has been generated and the fact that that is a pool of liquid metal. Liquid space metal, the rarest metal in the game that you can get your hands on. All four offer just the chance of producing just a little bit more tungsten. That, that, uh, this game, there are so many crazy things you can do so long as you're willing to, you know, break all the laws of physics, reason, time, space, and your own sanity because of the amount of time it would take to build something like this. Uh, when this thing overfills uh, just a little bit, and by that I mean when these pipes eventually hit the prerequisite temperature and they break, what will happen is they will fall down in here. And when they fall down in here, the tungsten will instantly sort of uh, solidify, but also some of the niobium is going to leak out of the pipes, some of that liquid coolant. So when that happens, this uh, fills up a little bit more and this liquid pump, well, once it hits a certain thresher, pressure threshold, this here scoops out some of the niobium using a little liquid ventric, and then that will get pumped back into the system. The across the top. Uh, most of the pipes here notice, are made of insulation. Also, one of the rarest and hardest to get your hands on materials in the game. Also, you can produce just that little bit more tungsten. According to Roland, this thing took about five or six hundred cycles to spin up. Um, or, you know what, let's, let, let's put it another way. This is what his map looks like, because he got bored while he was waiting. Uh, that entire map is just covered in plastic tiles. <laughs> Yes, that is the map of someone who spent a long time. There's a there's a number four in our list, a petroleum boiler. There's also a mini sour gas boiler, which is number well, sorry, this is number five in our list, and this is number four in our list, and he's got, you know, a couple of those built into his his base because of course he does. This is uh oh yeah, yeah. This is one of those bases where everything has been done because you were waiting for five or six hundred cycles for your ludicrous project to kick in. Now this is not one of the bigger ones by any chance, but it's definitely one of the harder ones to set up. This is not easy. This takes a huge depth of knowledge in the mechanics, but if you're looking for a really good challenge, yeah, replicating something like this might be just right up your alley. We're just coming up on the po point here where these pipes are getting almost to the temperature where they're going to melt. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Ah, there we go. Pipe has melted. We have got ourselves 100 kilos of... Wait, no, 75 kilos of tungsten. All of that for 75 kilos of tungsten. Oh, there's a, a built-in overflow system here. So once this uh, can't pass through, the overflow kicks in just to stop everything backing up and the whole system backing up. Uh, the plan now would be to, of course, replace this pipe. That, yeah, that that's what we call melting insulation. And that's why that is number three on our list. If you're looking for a, a really big challenge, I would maybe not recommend doing this. This is actually, the reason I still include this in the build is it's quite relevant. Uh, on some maps, you can end up on a map where there is no tungsten in the stars, as in you do not have a tungsten planet out there to pull tungsten back from, which will limit your gameplay if you're looking for as much thermium as possible. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll leave number three on our list and move on to number two. Ooh, big thanks to again to Ronan Ireland for this map. For number two on our list, we are going to a map submitted by Cohen Visser during Base Loving Seven. This one, this one is absolutely ludicrous. As you can imagine, this is taking the number two spot, and it takes it quite handily, in my opinion. Nothing can really compete with the ludicrousness of this project, because what we're doing is we're taking regolith. Now, regolith falls out of the skies. It comes down from space, and let's just grab a lump of it somewhere over here. Yeah, see, it. this lump here. This regolith lands down, and it has a melting point of 1,409 degrees. What we're doing is we're running a regolith melter. Well, Cohen's doing. Now, if we go back down here to... Where is it? Here. What you see is the regolith is passing through this counterflow regolith exchanger on conveyor belts. So it's passing through on conveyor belts, and the cool stuff is coming in one direction. It starts off at about 238 degrees. By the time it exits that, it's 1406.5 degrees. Down here, it's 1409 is the melting point, but you have to go about two points beyond it. So you're at about... Mm, you're about six points off melting the regolith. The weird thing is though, when you melt regolith, some weird, weird things happen. For one thing, the uh, 
I don't really want to get into too much detail, but the specific heat capacity of regolith is 0.2. However, when regolith melts, it turns into magma. Magma has a specific heat capacity of 1, which is 5 times greater. Also, when the, the magma solidifies into igneous rock, same thing, it has a specific heat capacity of 1. So you're taking regolith, heating it up, turning it into something else, which then has much greater heat in it. So you've increased the amount of energy by 5. You've, you've multiplied by 5 whatever energy was already in the rock. And the great thing is, the regolith you're sending back counterheats it, so all you have to do is raise the, the temperature of the regolith by a tiny amount to create an enormous amount of heat potential. How much heat potential? Well, after this comes down here and gets heated by this magma tank, it counterflows up here, goes through this area, and then when it comes out, it's still 1100 degrees. That's, that's way too much heat. What are we going to do with it? Well, feed it into steam turbines. So... This whole system feeds through here and dumps heat into this system. There's some doors here to inject heat across. That allows this whole thing, these all these steam turbines to run. There's some cooling here to cool down the steam turbines if needs be. And it just keeps going and going and going. That's, that's just a lot of steam turbines to generate power from. Then it goes up here and this is a dirt cooker, right? It's got a built-in dirt cooker. This isn't even to build power, it was just they wanted dirt. So you need to heat up algae and stuff like that. What's on that conveyor rail? Uh, that is empty. No, you're not empty. There's actually something on there. But as it passes through here, usually it's slime, I believe, that's going through here. The slime eventually heats up. Once it heats up to a certain point, the slime solidifies and turns into dirt. And then the mining drills mine it out and you end up with some dirt. Just a nice little system. Then... Unfortunately, it's still got way too much heat in it. It's coming out at 500 degrees. So it goes up here and even more steam turbines. And even more steam turbines. And even more steam turbines. And now 281 degrees, so even more steam turbines. And then it comes back here. By the time it gets out to here, what are we looking at? 159 degrees. Close enough. Close enough. You're not, it, it takes too long to get any cooler. Then it goes through this giant cooling loop before being dropped off down here. I believe that's then whisked off to be fed to stone hatches or something along the lines. So let's get a bit of a zoom out here to realize all of this here, all of this here, uh, all of this here, all of this, all of this dirt cooker, all of this here, and all of this all belong to one device. Just one regolith melter. Okay, and then just to add insult to injury, the leftover magma, because the magma here, sometimes it gets a bit chilly, so that's just uh, cycled out, and it's fed it to a petroleum boiler. Yes, the number the number five item on our list is actually just, it's used to bleed off the waste product of the number two item on our list. And that whole, uh, there was a, a, an annoying volcano in the way, so the petroleum boiler was built around it. Look at that. All the way down to make this giant pool of petroleum. Right, so if you'll notice, this is the bottom of the map where the magma starts, and this is where the bottom of the petroleum boiler is, which then leads up into the regolith melter, which leads into the counterflow, which leads into the, the wooden volcano that's powering it all, which goes through all the steam turbines, the dirt cooker, the final stage cooling, more steam turbines, and all the way to space. The entire left-hand side of the map is just one giant regolith melter. Like, what the hell? Good job, Cohen. Good job. That is just uh, amazing. One thing that gets me is uh, I put up this map and then over the next two or three weeks there was a bunch of regolith melters put out by, uh, you know, people on YouTube and stuff like that going on about how to do regolith melters. Not one of them gave, gave credit to poor Cohen here. I have never seen anyone build one of these in survival. I've seen people throw them together in uh, debug mode. I've never built one of these in survival. It's way too goddamn much effort. That is just trying to balance that out and get it to work. Anyway, yes, that is number two on our list. And before we go any further, we're going to do a few honorable mentions. Our first honorable mention goes to the industrial sauna. Now, an industrial sauna is where you grab all your heat-producing equipment, like, uh, say, your natural gas generators, make them out of steel, your petroleum generators, make them out of steel. Effectively, just make all of your heat-producing buildings out of steel and dump them into a big steam room. You usually have to put in a bunch of temperature shift plates because they don't produce a lot of heat very quickly, but spread out. And you dump all the excess heat into your steam turbines. The joy of an industrial sauna is you can just throw in large power transformers, batteries, all that stuff, and you don't have to care. The heat will just be eaten. In fact, it generates you power, dumping it all into one room. Yeah. Downside, you have to make everything out of steel. Um, that's kind of expensive, and on some maps that might be almost impossible. But upsides, you can just dump in a load of heat. 
Now, if any of you have noticed something odd about this, did, did you notice it yet? Because I didn't notice it first time I looked. There's a volcano. There's a volcano right there. <laughs> right there inside the industrial zone. There's a freaking volcano. Okay, it's a minor volcano, but it's a volcano. Who does that? Well, Tenom does it. Uh, base leveling in 15. I completely blanked this when I was going through. I never thought to look. Hey, I wonder if they've got a volcano in their industrial sauna. Who does that? I mean, if I saw a volcano in the way of where I was going to place my industrial sauna, I would have just placed it somewhere else. I didn't think, you know what? Why not just leave it in there and then we can use that to generate even more power? Goes to show you, there's when it comes to, to um, oxygen not included, there's two ways to go about things. You can, you know, turn things off and, and take it cautious. Or you can go, wait a minute, no, no, let's turn things up to 11. And that's what I would like to think of as this industrial sauna. And that's why it gets an honourable mention. It's not technically a machine or device you'll use, but it is a way of playing that can be uh, used quite interestingly. Our next honourable mention goes to Putz from Base Loving 14. This one... Yeah, this one's an honourable mention because I'm not sure... <laughs> it doesn't even skirt the edges of usefulness, unfortunately. What we've got here is a desalinator. Um, now, you may be wondering why a desalinator is getting an honourable mention on this list. It's because of the way the desalination is going on and it's brute force heating. As in, there is salt water being pumped in here and then that salt water is being heated up. There's a magma being dropped down here. The magma is injected into these areas and the uh, salt water that falls in and comes into these pipes is uh, evaporated, turned into steam. And that leaves behind all the salt and gets you a nice 95C clean water, which can then be used by the rest of your base. Now, what makes this truly ludicrous, if it was just that, I mean, it might not quite have made the honorable mention list, but what definitely makes it make the honorable mention list is the magma pumps. There is these vents here, and that is not liquid steel, that's liquid magma. All the way down here, we, over here, and down to this point. Yes. Magma is being pumped out of this section by these pumps. Now, this is a little trick that's been known for a while, but uh, the, there's a cross section when it comes to pumps. So they take out of the, they pump out of this square, one above it, one below it, one to the left, and one to the right. But they only activate if there's water in the four tiles here. Or is it the three tiles here? Oh, never mind. Bottom two tiles, maybe. So, so long as you put a liquid there, it'll start pumping. But if there's a liquid in this tile below it, you can pump it out. Meaning these things can pump out this magma without actually touching it, which means they don't overheat, which means you can do it. You just have to make sure you uh, drop down a little bit of liquid to make sure that they keep activating, but not so much liquid that it pours over the edge and, you know, combines with your magma, then you're going to get sour gas and all sorts of problems. Tricky, but very doable. Most people use uh, visco gel. It's very handy for that as well. And there is a whole bunch of magma being pumped around the map. This map is very accurately called magma pumps for a reason. That is just insane. Oh, and I should point out if we go to, oh, not the power overlay, oxygen overlay, this big red gap in the middle. Yeah, that's just a vacuum. That's an entirely massive vacuum to make sure all of the, the magma that's flowing around the place and the pipes that are carrying it don't overheat. Sort of ludicrous. So for an honorable mention, we have a magma powered with magma pumped powered uh, desalinator. Yes, yes, perfectly normal. Our final honorable mention is a carbon sink. Now, the reason this is an honorable mention is you don't really need one of these anymore. This was designed back when carbon dioxide was very valuable for getting yourself a renewable sort of dirt. A renewable source of dirt. Before that, well, since then, we've got renewable sources of dirt. That means you don't need to go to such ludicrous extents. All that's going on here is there's a giant cooling loop going across the top of the map. And as meteors come in, they give off carbon dioxide. So what you can do is if you put a cooling loop up there, you can make sure that the carbon dioxide can't escape back into space. And then after the doors have closed, you can go about harvesting all of that carbon dioxide and dumping it into these little liquid pumps over here. How much carbon dioxide is it worth to you, though? I mean, it can't be that much, right? Well, 2.1 kilos per second. For one of these modules here, 2.1 kilos per second. This whole thing is producing about 4.1 kilos per second on average. Now, bear in mind, that was, that was measured over 100 cycles or so. So at times you're going to have more, at times you're going to have less. That's just ludicrous. <laughs> Uh, if you want to do something, say, stupid with it, like, let's say, go down to the bottom of the map here. Uh, where were we? Yeah, this is an older base. This, I think, was Quality Life Mark Three when this was made. How would you like 168 to run 168 Slicksters? Yep, there you go. You can get 
you'll have enough carbon dioxide to feed them all and keep them going. There's also a petroleum boiler over here and there's a sour gas boiler over here. So that will give you even more carbon dioxide to play around with. It'll all be coming out of those uh, natural gas generators. So that would be my last honourable mention, simply on the grounds that it, it's it's no longer viable. You don't need such a, a contraption anymore because of the new ways to get dirt. But the only reason you'd want this is to run lots of slicksters and there's no need for that because of shovels. So unfortunately, this is also another design that uh, only gets the honourable treatment. Eh, but finally, on to our last contestant. If you followed my channel at all, this should be of no surprise to you that the rocket chimney takes the number one spot for ludicrously oversized stupid things you can build. Is this thing reasonable? No. No, this thing is not reasonable at all. Is it necessary? No, not at all. But it does do kind of what it sets out to do, which is produce an infinite amount of sustainable energy, well, a sustainable amount of energy that's effectively infinite, and it also generates you an enormous amount of water. For those of you who, are, who have not seen this before, rockets, when you launch them, they give off steam, and the longer it takes for them to get off the map, the more steam they'll give off. They keep emitting steam. Now, they'll give more at the, the launch point and the landing point. They do they emit an awful lot of steam right here. But as they're going up and down the map, they do keep emitting steam. And the longer you make your launch tunnel, well, the more steam you can trap. In fact, you can track so much steam that if you condense it, turn it into water, split it up to make hydrogen and oxygen, you can fuel more. You actually get more fuel out of it than you put into the rockets to begin with, meaning you're generating excess water. And at the same time, you're generating heat, which can be turned into power by steam turbines. This just gets ludicrous. I'm not going to go into any real more details than that, but this thing is not even working at full capacity yet. We're still waiting on insulation. Uh, and it's already way, way, way off the charts in terms of what it can do. For example, on the map here, this used to be the uh, cryo brick for uh, industry. All of the power generation has been removed. The only thing is left the hydrogen, but none of that's been burnt off. It's been turned into more fuel. So the only power we're generating on this entire map is being generated by this uh, rocket chimney. So let's have a quick look and see just how much power is being generated every cycle. Uh, power usage. The colony is generating that much power. My calculator tells me that is 51 petroleum generators worth of power. Yep, 51 petroleum generators worth of power, which is 10 times more than a petroleum, gen uh, petroleum boiler. As in number one on our list, this generates 10 times more power. As well as that, it generates water. If you'll... Ah, damn it. Zoom function. If you'll look on the side of the map there, you'll notice that there's a bunch of water. An awful, awful lot of water. Yeah, the map's starting to get a little bit flooded. Uh, the reason for that is you can siphon off the water and dump it down the sides. But a weird quirk I never knew is uh, it, I used to think that water would always flow down and repressurize the other side. Maybe it's just how wide this is or it's only three tiles uh, uh, three tiles narrow going through here. Maybe that's what's stopping it. But the water's not equalizing in pressure. So for some strange reason, this is ending up way taller than the other side. But don't worry, we've got airflow tiles and a bunch of diamond tiles. Airflow tiles can't break under pressure, but I threw in the diamonds just because it's nice. But uh, these things are not all happiness and rainbows. These rockets have a tendency to smash through the doors every so often. Uh, if you look here, these every single one of these here, they're all hooked up to a different rocket, and all of these bear one. So this map, there's 21 rockets, I want to say. Yeah, there's about 21 rockets trapped inside this silo doing launches and landings all the time. But if you're looking for a project to do that involves, well, an awful lot of time, effort, precision, cooling, piping, plumbing, everything, this is the project for you. I am pretty sure I will die of old age before I ever get to finish this <laughs> because it takes so long to make. Just the access points alone, you have to make sure you've got in drills to stop Regolith from falling in. Regolith's going to come in here. You're, you're 21 rockets coming and going at all hours. Yeah, Regolith is going to get in here. But this is my number one pick for ludicrously oversized designs. And yes, it's one of the ones I built myself, so I know that's kind of cheating and unfair. But you know what? Yeah, I don't think I've seen anything this big in terms of designs otherwise. I think the the, the regolith melter is probably the one that comes closest to a, a design like this. If you are if you have some free time right now because of uh, all the social isolation, well, you can pick one of the uh, five projects that have been presented and maybe build one of those into your one of your bases. Or... Build all five of them if you want. I've never gotten, ar gotten around yet to doing that regolith melter. I really would like to give one of those a try at some point. But no, no, no. I think I think uh, I think I'm good for the moment. I'll, I'll wait until after I finish this uh, this rocket chimney. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my uh, very arbitrary list of ridiculous build builds, and uh, hope you stay safe and good luck.